Hey, hello, hi. We're going to have another one of our short stories tonight. We're doing a range of different things, aren't we? Uh, the other day we had Rudd, you had Kipling's Just So Stories. Last night we had Aesop's Fables. The other day we had some uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales. We have had uh, some Slavonic folk tales, haven't we? And we've got loads of others to come as well. Tonight we're going to visit... Bring, 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 a bit of super hands. Hans Christian Andersen's te fairy tales tonight. Um, so everybody knows the ugly duckling. Everybody knows Thumbelina. What else has he got in the front here? Everybody knows the little mermaid. <laughs> Not the Disney one, thank you. Everybody knows um, Princess and the Pea, the Emperor's new clothes. They're all Hans Christian Andersen stories, aren't they? One in the contents, though, that I spotted and I haven't ever heard before, maybe you have, The Goblin at the Grocers. I ain't never heard this one before. So as I read it, it's going to be the first time I've ever heard it. So we'll just go for it, all right? Um, we noticed the other day, didn't we, that lots of fairy tales use that archaic language. The Just So stories use that archaic language. Blimey, Aesop, he's... um. He's from Grecian times, isn't he? And he definitely uses that archaic language. So, I've it's been a while since I've read an actual Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale. Like I said, they've been kind of um, replicated loads over time, haven't they? But I can't remember off the top of my head what kind of language he uses. But, hey, in about ten seconds, we're going to find out. So, got a cup of tea, got a slice of cake, sitting comfortably ready for the goblin at the graces. There was once a student, a proper student, Blake. He lived in an attic and owned nothing at all. There was also a grocer, a proper grocer. He lived on the ground floor and owned the whole house. And so it was with the grocer that the goblin chose to make his home. Where did the goblins suddenly come from? Besides, every Christmas he was given a bowl of porridge with a great lump of butter in it. The grocer could manage that easily, and so the goblin stayed in the shop. There's a moral there somewhere if you look for it. One evening a student came in through the back door to buy some candles and cheese. His shopping was quickly done and paid for, and the grocer and his wife nodded. Good evening. The wife could do more than nod, though. Hello. She was a chatterbox. Talk, talk, talk. She had what they called the gift of the gab. <laughs> no doubt about that. The student nodded back and then his eye f fell on something written on the paper wrapping the cheese and he stood there reading it. It was a page torn from an old book, one which should have never been torn up at all. An old book full of poetry. Hey, there's more of that book if you want it said the grocer. I gave an old woman some coffee beans for it. You can have the rest for sixpence if you like. Thanks, said the student. <laughs> Let me have it instead of the cheese. <laughs> I don't know what that accent is. I can do very well with the bread. It's a shame to use such a book for wrapping paper. You're an excellent man. <laughs> oh, we got Australian to South African. You're an excellent man. A practical man. But you have no idea of poetry. More than that tub over there. <laughs> now this was a rude thing to say, especially the part about the tub. But the grocer laughed and the student laughed. After all, it was only a kind of joke. But the little goblin was annoyed that anyone should dare to speak like that to the grocer. His landlord, an important person who owned the whole house and sold the best quality butter. That night, when the shop was shut and everyone but the student had gone to bed, the goblin tiptoed in and borrowed the grocer's wife's gift of the gab, for she had no need of it while she was asleep. Then, whatever object he put it on in the room was able to voice its views and opinions quite as well as the lady herself. But only one thing at a time could have it, and that was a blessing. Otherwise, they would have all been chattering away at once. First, the goblin put the gift of the gab on the tub where the old newspapers were kept. Is it 
really true, he asked, that you don't know what poetry is? Of course I know, said the tub. It's something you find at the bottom of the page in a newspaper. People cut it out. I rather think that I have more poetry in me than the student has, yet I'm only a humble tub compared with the grocer. Then the goblin placed the gift of the gab on the po on the coffee mill. Goodness, how it clattered on. After that, he put it on the butter cask, then the cash till. They all echoed the views of the tub, and the views of the majority have to be respected. Now, I can put that student in his place, said the goblin, and he tiptoed softly up the back staircase to the attic where the student lived. There was a light inside, and the goblin peeped through the keyhole and saw the young man reading the tattered book from the shop. But how bright it was in that room! Out of the book rose a shining beam of light. It became a tree stem, the trunk of a noble tree that soared up and spread its branches over the student. The leaves were fresh and green, and every flower was the face of a lovely girl. Some had dark, mysterious eyes, some had eyes of sparkling blue. Every fruit was a shining star, and the air was filled with an indescribably beautiful sound of singing. The little goblin had never seen or known of such wonders. He could never have imagined them even. And so he stayed at the door, standing on tiptoe, peeping in, gazing and gazing, until the light in the room went out. The student must have blown out his candle and gone to bed, but still the goblin could not tear himself away. His head rang with the marvellous music, which still echoed in the air, lulling the student to sleep. This is beyond belief, said the goblin to himself. I certainly never expected anything of the kind. I think I shall stay in the attic with the student. Then he pondered a while and then he sighed. Oh, one must be sensible, he said. This student hasn't got any porridge. And so, yes, he went down again to the grocer's shop. And it was a good thing he did, because the tub had nearly worn out the gift of the gab, what with telling everyone all the news and views of the papers stacked inside. It had done so from one angle and was just about to turn over and gabble it all again from another. When the goblin took the gap took the gab back to the sleeping wife and from that time the whole shop from the cash till to the firewood took all their opinions from the tub and they held it in such respect that ever after when the grocer was reading out criticisms of plays or books from the newspapers they thought that he had learned it all from the tub but the goblin could no longer sit quietly listening to all the wisdom and good sense that was uttered down in the shop. No, the moment the light began to shine through that attic door, he seemed to be drawn there by powerful strings, and up he had to go and station himself at the keyhole. And each time he did this, a sense of unutterable grandeur would sweep through him, the kind of feeling that we might have at the sight of a stormy sea whose waves are so wild that God himself might be riding over them in the blast. How wonderful it would be to sit under the tree with a student, but that could never be. Meanwhile, he was grateful to have the keyhole. He gazed through it every night, standing there on the bleak landing, even when the autumn winds blew through the skylight, making him nearly freeze with cold. Yet he felt nothing of this until the light went out in the attic room and the music faded away in the howling of the wind. <sighs> Then he would realise how cold he was and he'd creep down again to his secret corner of the shop where it was so snug and warm. Soon there would be a Christmas bowl of porridge with its great lump of butter. <gasps> yes, the grocer was the right one to choose after all. But late one night the goblin was woken up by a frightful commotion. People were banging at the shutters. The watchman was blowing his whistle. A fire had broken out and the whole street seemed ablaze. Which house was burning? This one or the next? Where was the fire? What screams, what panic, what a fuss? The grocer's wife was so flustered that she took her gold earrings from her ears and put them in her pocket so that she might at least save something. The grocer dashed after his bonds, the maid after the silk shawl that she'd bought with her wages. Everyone ran to collect the thing he or she prized most highly. 
and the little goblin did so too. In a bound or two, he was up them stairs and in the room of the student who was standing quite calmly at the open window, looking out at the fire in the house across the road. The goblin seized the wonderful book from the table, put it in his scarlet cap and hugged it with both arms. The most precious thing in the house was saved. Then he rushed up to the roof, right to the top of the chimney stack, and there he sat, lit up by the flames of the house on fire over the way, still firmly clasping the red cap with the treasure inside. Now he knew where his heart lay. Student? Grocer? His choice was made clear. But when the fire had been put out and the goblin had had time to think more calmly, well, I'll divide my time between them, he decided. I can't quite give up the grocer because of porridge. Just like a human, really. We do like to keep on good terms with the grocer because of the porridge. There you go. There's that one. What did you think of that one? First time I'd ever heard it. It went all that, really. I suppose, like, it's about choices, wasn't it? But yeah, should we have one more? Let's have let's have one more. I am um, I just need to stop, and I need to do the world's biggest yawn. <laughs> Did you notice how I had to keep stifling them all the way through that? So give me a sec. Okay, we'll just do a really really short one. Another one of Hans Christian Andersen's stories. More people know this one, I think. The Princess and the Pea. Like I said, it's only a mega short one. It's literally two pages long, but we'll do it, and it'll be nice. Here we go. The Princess and the Pea. There was once a prince who wished to marry a princess, but a real princess she had to be. I follow his way of thinking. So he travelled all the world over to find one, yet in every case something was wrong. Eh. Princesses were there in plenty, yet he could never be sure that they were the genuine article. There was always something, this or that, that just didn't seem as it should be. At last he came back home, quite downhearted, for he did so want to have a real princess. One evening there was a fearful storm, thunder raged, lightning flashed, rain poured down in torrents. It was terrifying. In the midst of his all, someone knocked at the palace door and the old king went to open it. Stand in there was a princess, but goodness, what a mess she was in. The water ran down her hair and her clothes through the tips of her shoes and out of the heels. Still, she said she was a real princess. Well, said the queen, we'll find out soon enough. She didn't say a word, though, but went to the spare bedroom, took off all her bedclothes and laid a little pea on the mattress. Then she piled up 20 more mattresses on top of that and 20 eider downs over that. There, the princess was to go to sleep at night. When morning came, they asked the princess how she'd slept. Oh, shockingly, not a wink of sleep the whole night long. Heaven knows what was in my bed, but I lay on something hard that has made me black and blue all over. It was quite dreadful. Now they were sure that here was a real princess, since she had felt the pee through twenty eider downs and twenty mattresses. She's had to share a bed with one of my kids when they were babies as well, then. Only a real princess could be so sensitive, or a Mr. S. So the prince married her. No need to search any further. The pee was put in the museum. You can go and see it for yourself if no one has taken it. There is a fine story for you. There you go. We'll, uh, we'll do another couple of hands, Christian Andersons, toward the tail end of our short story season that we're doing. There you go. Did you like them ones tonight? I must say, of the fairy tale, like the kind of the main fairy tale tellers, Hans Christian Andersen, he ain't, he ain't quite my favourite. I'll tell you what, though. Like, of course... I'm alluding to the Grimm brothers, the brothers Grimm. When I when I went on holiday once to Germany, I went to like it was a it was the whole theme park based on the, the brothers Grimm. Oh man, 
I loved that place. I can't remember. I don't know whether anybody who's listening is from Germany or can speak German. But I remember, and I was only little, we had to go up to this thing and go, Rubischwal, Rubischwal, like that. And like it would spit a gold coin out. I'm sure it was near the Black Forest that it was. And um, there was another one. There was like Rapunzel's hair. You had to like pull on it and something else happened. But whoa, as a little boy, this place was fantastic. I don't know. I don't think because I did go again a few years later when I was about maybe in my late teens. And I think, is it? Or it might have been, I don't know, it still exists, Europa Park or something, I don't know. But it was, the, this Grimm Brothers area was just part of Europa Park. It used to be the main thing. But, um, yeah, and there was like an upside down house. I'm going to Google it after this. I'm going to find it. I'll, if I find it, I'm going to put a link down below so you can see that I'm not telling fibs. Anybody else who would go to that? This So when I would would have gone would have been the very very early 80s when I'd have been there saying Rubichval Rubichval for a free chocolate coin fantastic times anyway thanks very much for listening and tomorrow what should we have tomorrow we haven't yet had an Edgar Allan Poe we haven't yet had a ghost story and we haven't yet had a Greek or Roman myth or legend. Should we do some Greek, Roman myths and legends tomorrow? Friday night and all that. Let's get crazy. We'll do it tomorrow. All right. Oh, comments. Nearly forgot, didn't I? Let's do comments. Uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. Here's Mary Bull. Thanks again for Aesop's Fables. I have not read them in a very long time, so it was good to get some of the lesser known ones. I think most fairy tales, folklore tales, have a similar element in trying to teach us some sort of lesson. Yeah, I think so too. Uh, his Ting Bonkers. Ping Ting! His Ting Bonkers. Let's go, Mr. S. Great accents. Oh, you. Thanks. What for the Aesop's ones, Ting Bonkers? I didn't think, I, I felt a little bit flat last night doing Aesop's. I did some crazy accents the night before with um, Just So Stories, if you want to have some crazy accents. <laughs> but thanks, Ting Bonkers. Here's Shania McTai. This is lovely. I loved listening to this. Sat with a nice cup of tea. Perfect. You are 10 out of 10 spot on, Shania McTie. And relaxed while listening. Love hearts for you. His study. This is so good. You have a great reading voice. Thanks, study. So do you. Uh, here's Terry. Mr. S, did you do bean chilli? Yeah, I did, Terry. Bean chilli. Um, I can't remember what beans, but yeah, it was bean chilli. And I had leftovers from a lunch today, and it was still just... That's perfect. I loved that tea time. Uh, his Lady C. Love Aesop. And thank you for reading to us. It's all right, Lady C. My pleasure. His Lady C again. I oh, she's, this is when she's reading Vasilisa and the Golden Tress. I still haven't gone to the end of this story. I keep falling asleep. Come on, mate. Wakey, wakey. I'll tell you what. Last night as well, who commented? I saw Blake commented. Guys, I have to say... Dad recommended me a meditation video last night to listen to. I've had a hot chocolate and put my headphones on and slept from 11pm till 11am. Best sleep ever. Blake spoke on there. That's nice. Hello, Blake. But also, some of Blake's friends did. Amy Xocks. This was great. We loved it, Blake's friends. Amy Xocks. Thank you. Lucy Ellis did as well. Was very entertaining. <laughs> Thanks. I like them reviews. So, to the point. No, it's all right. And randomly, oh, YouTube is now updating. Randomly, I got another extra 13, one, three subscribers last night. Where the heck did they all come from? I never get that many, especially recently. I haven't had new subscribers for ages, but all of a sudden I got 13 in one fell swoop last night. Hey, Terry, it's you with your... Um, I can't remember the word. What's it called? Uh, but 
I don't know. I think you were doing anyway, Terry. That's what it is. Pushing me out there, Terry. Pushing me out there. All right. Okay. I'm going to stop talking now. Hey, if you're someone from rural school, not from town school, from rural school, I'm coming tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow. All right. I'm looking forward to it. See you all soon.